Egypt, a land of history, culture, and an appetite for energy that's growing faster than ever. Did you know Egypt's energy consumption soared past 160,000 million kilowatt hours last year? That's like running 338 billion 60 watt light bulbs nonstop for a year. To keep up, Egypt relies on the usual suspects, oil and gas, making up almost 90% of the energy mix. But here's the catch. Burning these fuels isn't doing us any favors. It's responsible for three quarters of all greenhouse gas emissions, nudging us closer to that dreaded 1.5 degree global warming limit. Yikes, right? But what if it was a way to turn things around? On this episode of On the Green Path, we explore how Carm Solar is driving a cleaner, more sustainable future. We are surrounded by hundreds of solar panels Tell me, how much diesel does this offset? How much are these people saving by switching to solar? So in this station, it's not only about the diesel. So the farm over here are mainly using the government grid. So what we're doing here is that we're supplying almost 90 something percent of the client's need. If we talk strictly in terms of emissions, how much are we offsetting by using something like this? So this station is actually saving around five tons uh, of carbon emissions daily. Solar energy has plenty of benefits, but it's not without its downsides. Some environmental concerns include land degradation, loss of biodiversity, and the impact on traditional farmland. The thing is that when we went to them, we told them, guys, give us the worst piece of land that you have. So whenever you're, you're into big farms, usually you have some plots of land that are not used. So, and this was the case over here. So if you have, let's say a 3000 acre uh, plot, probably there are areas that you wouldn't use. And this was actually one of the areas that they did not use because it had a lot of uh, stone, so they could not plant it. So that's the good thing. This is all very impressive. The infrastructure is massive, but this will not last forever. Solar panels typically have a life cycle of, let's say, 30 years. What happens after that? The solar station would actually still work after 30 years, but the thing is that uh, at that time, probably it wouldn't be efficient. So what will happen, it will be one of two things. Either the removal of the solar station over there and recycling of the materials, or actually rehabilitation of the station, changing the panel, changing the inverters, changing I mean, the main components of the station in order for you to have another 30 years uh, of extra uh, electricity supply. For now, this technology is obviously advanced greatly, but what do you think the next wave of solar panels will be like? What are the current challenges or issues with the technology that we're sort of working to rectify with the next generation? So I've been in the solar business for the past 12 years and it's all about efficiency. So how many uh, watts are you getting from the same solar panel size? So when I first started, I mean, this same panel would produce probably something around 15% of the current production, 20% of the current production of the same panel. So it's, a, it's an efficiency game. How are you going to get more efficiency or more um, output from the same panel. If Egypt keeps relying on fossil fuels, CO2 emissions could jump by around 125% between 2012 and 2035. But with a solar energy potential of 74 billion megawatts per year, that future could look very different. As the sun set, we headed to the Karm Solar offices to hear from founder Ahmad Zohron about how solar technology is being adopted and whether it is scalable. Can we rely on it completely? Can we say no more LNG, no more coal, we're going to be purely renewable? Technically, yes. Today, technology allows us to do that. Mm -hmm. Economically, we're not there yet. So there is a bit of work that needs to be done on the reduction of cost. But technically, this is a possible solution that can be done. And it is used in special circumstances where there is an absolute impossibility of reaching different types of fossil fuels. Egypt recently lowered its 2040 renewable energy target from 58% to 40%, with natural gas expected to remain a big part of the energy mix. Meanwhile, experts warn that the country's crude oil reserves could run out in the next 15 years. I do not really care what is the number that we're targeting. Um, because, you know, you might get to 60%, it might be less than that, it doesn't really make a difference. What I really care about is our ability to economically and technically be able to implement solutions that would take the biggest part of our energy mix. 
One of the main problems that we have today in Egypt is the upgrade of the grid. The power grid is one of the main constraints for increasing the renewable energy penetration within our power uh, generation. And that is one of the main things that we have to deal with. So even if renewable energy is economic in Egypt, across all sectors, and even if the batteries are economically viable, you would still have a problem in upgrading your grid. And that's why the situation is different from one place to the other. That's why Carm Solar works on power generation and power distribution. We wanted to look at the entire value chain because we realized that one of the reasons why renewable energy is not the mainstream is our grids were designed and our economic models were designed with fossil fuels in mind. They were not designed knowing that renewable energy is, is going to be qualified to be the mainstream source of electricity. And our grids and our utility infrastructure in general has been the same with no disruption for the past 70 or 80 years. So we realized that we have to be vertically integrated. We have to innovate on the utility level, not just on the power generation level. So it's not just about the solar stations or the wind farms. It's also about the grid. It's about energy management. It's about connecting all of them together and coming up with a comprehensive solution. And that's our business model and that's how we're tackling it. This is perfect, but you have so many elements and components that are coming from abroad. We're not self-sufficient in terms of raw materials. We can't say we're going to create, you know, uh, a battery farm tomorrow. We don't have the lithium for it. We don't have the minerals. How do you address that? It is important to realize that, you know, knowledge uh, has many aspects to it. So, for example, at Comsolar, we already have two patents and we're working on the third. So we are working on pushing the existing knowledge and we're contributing to the knowledge that is available for renewable energy. So we're not only technology consumers. It would be dangerous for any company or any society to only become energy consumers because consuming technology is like any other type of consumerism where you do not have a say on the tools that you're using for achieving progress within your society. And we have to be part of the technology development. There are certain parts that we as a company are not qualified to work on, mm -hmm. like hardware manufacturing, because it requires completely different type of investment and a different type of personnel. But we are qualified for that part of energy, of uh, knowledge development and contributing to the know-how when it comes to energy management, when it comes to grid design, when it comes to certain aspects of how the grid and the energy generation works. And that's what we're focused on. Over the past decade, the cost of photovoltaic solar panels has dropped by 90%, making solar power cheaper than fossil fuels. But despite that, solar energy made up just 8% of Egypt's renewable energy mix in 2021, mainly because of the high upfront costs. Now more than ever, investing in clean energy is key to securing a greener future. Mm -hmm.